Thank you, Heather. Uh, thank you all for being here on this snowy day. I know some of you just got out of class, but I know others of you made a special trip, and I, I thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to thank Heather in particular for organizing this event. It's part of our Integrity in Our Communities speaker series. And through this series, we try to bring uh, relevant and meaningful speakers to all of our campuses, uh, particularly for the benefit of our students. We hope that the speakers will give you some insights into uh, issues you may face as lawyers, into professions you may want to uh, think about trying for yourself, and into just sort of the daily issues that come up when, when uh, one is practicing law. Uh, I'm especially happy today to introduce our speaker, Phil Balcoma, uh, because on a personal note, his family and mine go back a long way, uh, actually to a place high in the forested dunes overlooking Lake Michigan called Eagle Crest, where for generations we get together on summer evenings and celebrate the sunset, and sometimes we recite a little poetry and have a toast to uh, how lovely life can be when you're on the beach at Lake Michigan. Uh, and with Phil today, as part of that Eagle Crest crowd, in particular his wife Laurel. Laurel, can you give us a wave? That's Phil's wife Laurel who has come to see him today. And I'd also like to introduce my own Aunt Patricia Timmer. Aunt Pat, give us a wave. <laughs> She's part of that Eagle Crest crowd, and she said Phil Balcoma can't possibly come and speak without my being there. And I'd also like to acknowledge my husband, Mark Mazervi, who made the trip over from Lansing with me. <laughs> I'm very honored to introduce Phil. He's had just a remarkable career. Let me, let me start by saying he is the longest serving city attorney in Grand Rapids history. And by longest serving, I'm talking about 33 years um, in the city attorney's office for uh, first as an assistant city attorney and then for 29 years as the city attorney. I learned from his wife, Laurel, that during that tenure, the staff in that office has not changed. Yeah, that you have been able not only to keep the same people there, but they've been able to do the same job. Imagine how the city has grown in 33 years and that Phil has been able to efficiently operate an office where uh, there hasn't even been uh, any significant turnover. Phil is a graduate of uh, both the University of Michigan's undergrad and law school, and uh, he's an active member in the Michigan Association of Municipal Attorneys, which is part of the Mich Michigan Municipal League. Um, he served many years as a member of that organization's board of directors, including two years as president. In 2005, that association honored Mr. Balcoma with the Distinguished Municipal Attorney Award from the Association of Mus Municipal Attorneys. And in 2006, Mr. Balcoma won the very prestigious uh, Frank J. Kelly Award, which recognizes extraordinary government service by a member of the State Bar of Michigan. Uh, Mr. Balcoma recently retired from his position just a month ago today, I believe, as city attorney after completing the longest tenure in that office of any city attorney, and he remains active with the Michigan Association of Municipal Attorneys. Nobody serves long in a position like that unless they have earned the confidence of many people and unless they have done an excellent job. Phil has obviously done both. Uh, please join me in welcoming Phil Balcoma, who will speak on representing City Hall, a lawyer's life on the public stage. Thank you, Thank you, Phil. Thank you Dean Timmer. Uh, last summer she said, uh, as a lawyer, do you believe in free speech? And I said, certainly. She said, good, I want you to give one. So. <laughs> So here I am, and I want to thank you and Heather for inviting me here today and giving me an opportunity to give you just a little bit of an idea of what it's like to be a city attorney in Grand Rapids. To put my reflections in a little more perspective, I thought I'd give you about a one-minute primer on city government in Grand Rapids. And prior to 1916, we had a strong mayor form of government and 27 aldermen. Looking at politics as it is today, you probably wouldn't think that we were ever a strong mayor city. But back in those days, in fact, most of the cities were strong mayor cities, uh, and they derived their powers from the legislature with local acts. They didn't have local charters like we do now. Local charters came in with the Home Rule Cities Act in 1909, and in 1916, Grand Rapids joined the sort of um, reform movement that was sweeping the country to get party politics, machine politics out of City Hall, and go with a council manager form of government. So that's what we've had for 92 years. 
Uh, recently, you've seen that sometimes that can cause stress between the council and the manager. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the council manager presumes that it's better to have elected officials set the general policy uh, tone for the city, and they do that by legislation, by adopting the budget, by deciding where the city's resources are going to be spent and how they're going to be spent, and by appointing the local officials, the top four officials in the city. Those officials, in fact, are the city manager, who is akin to a chief operating officer of, this, of a large corporation, and does the hiring and firing, and most recently hired uh, and made an appointment for police chief. Uh, because of that, the city commissioners uh, were a little bit upset because they had a different idea as to which of the final candidates should have been uh, awarded that position. And so you saw a little tension in that for a while, and hopefully that will work itself out. I can tell you from experience with working with both uh, now Chief Belk and with James Ferris, they are both fantastic people, total professionals, and they will do an excellent job for the city regardless of which position they're in. And the other appointed officials are the city attorney, we'll talk about that in a minute, the city clerk and the city treasurer. You all know what the clerk and treasurer do. The clerk runs elections and licenses businesses, takes all the minutes at the city commission meetings, and the treasurer basically collects taxes. We have three wards in the city. We have two commissioners from each ward, and we have one, commi one commissioner called the mayor who's elected from the city at large. And he does, he or she, uh, chairs all the commission meetings and uh, basically runs the meetings, but does not have a veto and does not have any more power than any of the other city commissioners. All these officers are appointed annually by the city commission. So when you hear that I've been there 29 years, I was hired 29 times. If you, if you haven't tried that, try it. It's, it's really fun. Um, <laughs> especially when the, the reappointment time is always either the last commission meeting of the year or the first one of the new year since our terms expire on the first Monday of the year. So the holiday season around the Balcoma House was always, is daddy going to have a job? <laughs> and, and, you know, luckily uh, for us, uh, we managed to do that. The city attorney is the chief legal advisor for the city, and it's akin to an in-house corporate counsel for a large corporation. And in fact, the city is a large corporation. Our annual budget's about $250 million, including all of the enterprise funds and everything else. And of course, we do everything from plow the streets and weather like this to run a police department, a fire department, uh, bring you drinking water, and uh, hopefully uh, do everything else that makes the quality of life in Grand Rapids worthwhile. The city attorney represents the city in all the courts and all the legal actions that are filed, whether we're the plaintiff, and that's not very often, or the defendant, and that's quite often, actually. Um, we prosecute ordinance violations. We have uh, both uh, civil infractions, of course, and misdemeanors. That's the level of our authority. We draft the ordinances and the contracts and the legal opinions for the mayor and commission and all the boards and commissions of the city. If you're familiar with the Attorney General and those opinions that come out, uh, ours aren't nearly as good, but within our little organization, they can sometimes have as much effect because people will turn to us and want to know whether they can do something and if it's legal. And so when we do that, hopefully they'll follow our instruction. Our office, uh, as Dean Timmer said, is, is really not as large as you would think it would be, and that's because we've been able to maintain uh, people over a long period of time who've developed a wonderful expertise, and without that, we would have to have two or three times, I think, the number of lawyers. So Grand Rapids is well served by the fact that 12 lawyers handle all the work in the city attorney's office. We are one-fourth the size of the city of Detroit, and they have 160. So we're doing a pretty good job, I think, here in Grand Rapids. Um, but I don't get any awards for empire building because having been there for 29 years, I wasn't able to add one, one more person to the staff. And that, that's sort of bad, I guess, in today's things. The budget, the budget did grow, though. I did get more money for the people. Um, we broke our, our office down into three basic uh, divisions based on what they do. The civil litigation division does just what it sounds like, works on civil litigation. The code enforcement division, likewise. And then the division that I worked with most closely was called the Municipal Affairs Division. The acronym for that was MAD. 
And the reason that we had that acronym is because we're the ones that had to work with the elected officials. And we thought that that was sort of close. We did have outside counsel and still do for certain specialty areas like environmental law, uh, labor law, uh, and some civil litigation when there's a conflict of interest that develops. Uh, we just can't staff on a full-time basis uh, enough lawyers to be able to, um, pardon me, to be able to have everybody there for every little issue that might come up. You just, you just can't do everything with a, a staff of, of 12 people. To put my job in perspective, um, think of your most demanding law professor in your toughest course on his or her worst day, calling on you suddenly without any notice with a very complicated legal question that you're obligated to answer, and it's on live TV in front of the news media with a large crowd. And that was my life on commission day for 29 years. And that's a fairly scary and responsible role. And nobody steps into it lightly and nobody steps into it knowing how to do it the first day. Believe me, I surely didn't. Knowing the right answer when you're asked a legal question is critical. You don't want your client to ask you a legal question and not know the answer, whether that's in your office or certainly if it's around a council table on live television. Knowing when to interrupt and inject yourself into a conversation being carried on around the council table when they didn't ask for your advice is almost as important. And that's even a little more scary because I'm down there at the end of the table going like this and suddenly the mayor will say, uh, Mr. City Attorney, do you have something to add? Well, add isn't always the right word because usually what you're going to do is subtract from what they're doing. <laughs> but for example, we're, we're about to enter into budget time and commissioners take uh, reasonable trips to things like the National League of Cities and uh, Michigan Municipal League conferences and those kinds of things and they come back with lots of good ideas. And we're entering the, the budget season right now and one of those good ideas, most assuredly, will be, you know, we can raise revenue if we do what they do in Georgia and just have a local sales tax. Because that way people that come into town to go to concerts and everything else, they spend money and they bring money into town and we'll get just a teeny tiny sales tax, just maybe a half a percent on everything that's bought and sold in Grand Rapids. Well, on first blush, that sounds like a great idea and maybe even the voters would go for it, but it's unconstitutional. Uh, for whatever reason, the, the people who did the Constitution back in 1963 had the wisdom to say, we don't want a bunch of local sales taxes. If there's going to be a sales tax, and of course there is, it's going to be done by the state legislature. What kind of things get thrown at you? Well, they come at you suddenly, and they come at you without warning, and they come at you sometimes in the dead of night. Uh, luckily, it wasn't often in the middle of the night. But things like getting called and saying that a prisoner in the city lockup, which thankfully we no longer have, has just hanged himself. Now, that in of itself is tragic, but the fact that that was the third hanging in six months starts to bring to mind the fact that maybe you have a lockup that probably needs to have a lot of attention paid to it. We're not doing something right. Shooting of a police suspect happens periodically. Sometimes it's just frankly unavoidable. And tragically, shooting of police officers. Pool drownings, we had two of those in my tenure as city attorney. A zookeeper was killed by a jaguar that got out of its cage because the cage was not properly designed. You get a call that the Ku Klux Klan has decided to anoint Grand Rapids and come here for a large rally. Isn't that fun? I mean, that's really what you want to have. I mean, nothing polarizes a community more than having the Ku Klux Klan come to town. Presidential visits. We had many of those while I was in office because we had a president who was from Grand Rapids. And that was a wonderful experience, but the things that go behind those seemingly wonderfully smooth visits are a lot of planning and a, and a lot of resources. And then lastly, of course, the presidential funeral. We have water main breaks. Doesn't sound like much until it's a 48-inch force main and it blows a piece of street out that's about 20 feet deep and 100 feet long and takes out two houses. You know, when, when that happens, you need to pay attention to those kinds of things. Uh, sewer backups, again, 
a little water in your basement, not so bad. When you have 400 homes with two feet of sewage in the same storm, that becomes a major event and a major problem. Blizzards. We had one the other day, and we took care of it pretty well, but it wasn't anything like the one that I got my first really full year in being in office when I was awakened at 6.15 by then city manager Joe Zania saying, it's a blizzard outside, and I want to know if the charter lets me close city hall. So sort of like the poem, I ran to the window and threw open the sash, <laughs> and I looked out, and I couldn't see anything, and I couldn't see you know mailboxes or anything. I went back and I tossed a coin. I said, yes, you can close City Hall. He said, thank you. I mean, you, you couldn't go anywhere anyway, so why not close City Hall? But those have ramifications. The people that had to work, police and fire and, and the snowplow operators, well, why should they work a regular shift if everybody else got the day off? So we had to have some labor things that settled that. And then, of course, there's the major lawsuits. And you never know when they're coming, but the news media always does because... <laughs> They always get served first. In fact, lots of times the news media will get the complaint before it's even filed with the court. Now with all the e-filing and everything, especially in federal court, if we hear of something being filed, we can go online, we can pull it off the, the e-filing system and actually get it before it's served on us. Well, no, plaintiff's attorneys are far too smart for that. They give it to the news media first. And why is that important? Well, because they want public officials, whether it's me or the mayor or the city manager, to comment on all these allegations Number one, before we've read the complaint, they even see what it's about. Or number two, before we had a chance to sit down with each other and say, what happened here and is there a chance that we're really at fault? So our practice is diversified, to say the least. And in that respect, working for the public sector is probably one of the most exciting jobs any lawyer can have. There are a lot of exciting jobs in all kinds of other governmental settings, whether it be the state or federal government agencies. My daughter works for the, for the Attorney General in Lansing, has a wonderfully exciting job. The difference between, I think, the private sector and the public sector is that whatever you do touches the public trust. And public trust these days is something that I think we need to concentrate on a little bit. The public and the media are always interested in what we do and they're interested for a couple of reasons. The city's actions affect their lives and their, and their quality of life, either through legislation or through police actions or their public services. We use citizens' tax dollars for virtually everything we do. So all of our salaries are paid by the citizens that we have a trust from and with to do a good job. And our decisions are made by appointed and elected officials. So we owe it to those people who are paying our salaries to act ethically and legally at all times. And that's where the city attorney's job comes in, a little bit. And that's to keep that covenant with the people and keep city government on a legal course, hopefully. Alan Grimes, who was a premier city attorney in the state of California and had a long and distinguished career, wrote a little pamphlet for what was then called the National Institute of, Muni of Municipal Law Officers, in which he stated, the finest duty of a city attorney that a city attorney can perform is to consider the office an active participant in city government, dedicated to the role of making it possible for the government of the city to accomplish what it wants to do in the best interests of the public. Now, if a city attorney uses that as his or her lodestar, you can't go wrong, because that's what it's about. I think city attorney must belong to the 4-H club, and not the one that has cows. Um, and that really is, you must subscribe to these four characteristics. Honesty, I think, is first. Always conduct yourself in an ethical and honest and professional manner, and that's both on and off duty. And you'll learn if you work for the government, whether you're an elected official or a hired employee or an appointed official, there is no off duty. Not anymore. Uh, humility. Don't take yourself too seriously. It's about the city and the public's interest. It's not about you. You have to have heart. You have to have the courage of your convictions to do what's right, despite what the public opinion is. And that sometimes is difficult. And finally, you have to have a sense of humor. And you really have to have a sense of humor to, uh, to survive 29 years in City Hall. Um, I'll take just a couple of minutes to go through some of these things and give you some ideas of some of the things that we had over the years that I think you might find interesting. And then I'll be happy to take some questions. 
Honesty is first and foremost. Without it, you have no credibility as a public official, and yet nationwide, it remains, I think, one of the biggest challenges for public officials, including city attorneys. The Ethics Resource Center last week in a report issue, that they issued last week indicated that 63% of local governmental employees said they witnessed unethical conduct in their workplace in the last year. Think of that. 63% witnessed unethical conduct. And only 9% of those same employees thought that their organization had a strong ethical culture within the organization. Just look at the news out of Detroit. And I promise not to dwell on this because it's way too easy and would take way too much time. Court counsel turn up the heat on the mayor. His actions, this is an editorial, are an affront to the city. Detroit News. Detroit should end attempts to conceal settlement files. This, of course, relates to the litigation that was settled last fall involving the mayor and his chief of staff. The Kilpatrick administration has decided to run out the string for as long as it can on the material contained in a secret agreement settling $9 million in lawsuits against the city. Sharon McPhail, counsel to the mayor, said the city will appeal a ruling making the material public, a decision that in no way serves the public interest. What's next? This is yesterday. Judge, probe the attorneys. Judge Callahan, who was the circuit judge that tried the case, now wants the trial attorneys investigated for breaches of ethics that they may have committed during the trial. If they knew perjured testimony was going to be offered and didn't stop it, or if they learned of it later and didn't bring it to the court's attention. I'm not judging the truth of any of these allegations. I'm just saying that when your picture and all of that is in the front page of the, of the Detroit News and you're the city attorney or you're the chief counsel for the mayor, that's not a good place to be, folks. I can tell you that. Finally, editorial yesterday, again in the Detroit News, judgment day has arrived for Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick. The longer he tries to, to, to delay an accounting, the worse his situation becomes. The mayor has turned to McPhail as his spokesperson in defending the decision to appeal a court ruling. She is a poor choice. She's always had a shaky relationship with the truth. What kind of reputation is that? And her comments in defense of the appeal are not only disingenuous, they're ridiculous. The stonewalling ought to end. This is not about the mayor's private life, as McPhail continues to plead. It's about whether city employees and city money were improperly used in a cover-up. The mayor cannot be effective if he can't be trusted. And that's what it comes down to. When you have a public office, whether you're the mayor, the city attorney, the city manager, if the public can't trust you, you are totally ineffective. And the central problem throughout all of this is, in fact, through most of the ethical things that come up, and the newsletter that we lawyers get every day from the state bar that has articles out of newspapers around the state, unfortunately, is replete with evidences of lawyers getting themselves into trouble either with the criminal law or just ethically. And it boils down to putting your self-interest above the public's interest. So the first thing that you have to do if you're a city attorney is you have to try to inculcate a, an atmosphere where ethics is on the forefront and where newly elected officials have the opportunity to come in and get trained on ethical issues. Because frankly, these are good, well-meaning people. They come from all walks of life. They run for election. They're business people, they're educators, they're whatever, they work for nonprofits. And they get into City Hall and lo and behold, they find that now some of their rights are taken away. They can no longer continue to sell all those things to the city that they used to sell under bid, just like they used to do it. There are very stringent state statutes on how you have to contract with the city if you're an employee. And that surprises them. It surprises them that they're on this board of directors of a nonprofit that they've served on for years. And now when that agency's contract comes up with the city, they have to abstain because they're on the board of directors. Those kinds of things surprise them, I think, because in a way they find out that they're a little bit of a second-class citizen. Trips. 
I can't tell you how many times well-meaning companies who want to do business with the city want to fly one or two of our commissioners out to have a fact-finding mission to go out and see what it's like to view their latest sewage treatment process or something, whatever. And believe me, there's all kinds of opportunities for that. My answer is always, if it's that important to go, the city should pay for your airfare. You go, if they want to buy you lunch while you're there, hey, you know, that's okay. No one's going to care about that. But don't go someplace across country on some company's airfare. Because you know what, when the bids come in, golly, you're going to just subconsciously remember that. And it also makes a difference whether that conference is in their, their corporate headquarters in Toledo, Ohio, or if it's in Orlando. And it happens to be in a big resort hotel where they're bringing people from all across the country to see this marvelous new invention that they have. You get the idea. It, each one of these issues is a fact-specific thing, and you just need to get your elected officials and your department directors to come to you and talk to you about it before it happens so that, in fact, they don't get too far down the road and have it end up on the front page of the paper. Just last year, there was some criticism about some pension board members who went to Hawaii for the annual pension convention. Okay, it was in Hawaii. They go to these conventions quite often, and they learn an awful lot. They come back from those conventions with a lot of great ideas. I know, because I was the legal representative to the pension board for 29 years. They don't cover the ones that are held in Dubuque, Iowa, or that are held in, in uh, Cincinnati. They cover the ones that are in Honolulu, of course. That's what makes front page news. Public officials find that they can't influence quasi-judicial boards, like the Planning Commission and the Zoning Board of Appeals. In fact, we had a case just like that a few years back where a city commissioner learned of an application to the zoning board involving his ward. He talked to some people out there who were very upset what this developer wanted to do with a parcel of property, and the neighbors were very objectionable to it. And so they called the city commissioner and said, do something. Well, he did. He made four or five phone calls at night, called members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, and told them just how much he didn't want that to go through. Who? Um, the next day, they had the public hearing. People came and testified, and when the hearing was done, and the Zoning Board is talking about what's going on, it was even mentioned that, well, I received a call from the commissioner indicating his staunch opposition to this project. That's good enough for me, kind of thing. Okay, that's where, as city attorney, you take a deep breath and you wait for the lawsuit to come, and it did, because the zoning board turned down the application. We got sued, and luckily, we got out of that case for a modest settlement, now, modest compared to what it could have been, by paying the developers out-of-pocket costs up to that point. We didn't have to pay lost profits and things like that. That's, those are tough things. Finally, on that topic of honesty, a simple thing, never lie. Just don't lie. If you work for the public, just don't lie. That sounds so simple. And yet, the newspapers are full of people who think, you know what, and it's not just local government, it's state government, federal government. It's, it's, it's a tendency to when you're caught doing something you shouldn't have done or you'll be embarrassed about, your first response is to lie. And it's like dripping blood in a pool for a, full of sharks, you know, they just brings in more sharks. And you'd think people would learn that. But the other side of that honesty coin is professionalism. And to be a professional, make your opinion based on your best legal reasoning and then stick to it. Don't go where the people want you to go if it's not right. Now, that sounds elementary, but the temptation to please a client is strong, especially if it's an elected official. And we can see that playing out in Detroit right now. I would like to think that some of those people, if they were making the, some of those decisions in a vacuum that didn't involve either a personal friend or their immediate supervisor or the mayor of the city, would be able to make a more professional call when it comes to what's right for the city. So the city attorney's job is to help the city do what it wants to do and do it in a legal way. And even if you do that, sometimes you're criticized by the media. I'll give you two quick examples. The Rabbit Lounge was a little neighborhood bar down in the wealthy and fuller area 15 years ago. And it was a nice little neighborhood bar, a place where people go after a softball game or something to have a beer before they went home. But over time, it got more and more tough. Motorcyclists came in, and nothing against motorcyclists, 
Um, but it became a, a different kind of a bar. And there were allegations that there was a lot of drug dealing going on, that weapons were being sold out of that bar. And it, it really degraded the area. And the business were struggling to hold on as it was. And so they came to City Hall and they just begged us, shut it down, just close it down. Well. As lawyers, we know that a liquor license is a vested property right, and you can't just go close a bar down. You have to do it for justifiable reasons. And we did not, at that time, have an ordinance on the books that would give us the reasons that we needed to do that. So while we're quickly doing that, we're also being dragged off to meetings in the neighborhood with all the business people telling us, and me and the police chief, why aren't you doing your jobs? Why aren't you arresting these people? Apparently because they're there, I guess. But why aren't you doing this? But what we couldn't tell them is that we had a really deep cover under, undercover operation going on in that bar. It was so deep, we didn't even use GRPD officers. We brought in two new state police officers from the Detroit Post, undercover, who spent about six weeks buying drugs, buying guns, making names, getting IDs, doing it right, building a book. And then we came down with 15 warrants, and we arrested the people, and we dragged the bar before the city commission with our new ordinance, and we had a two-day hearing, and the city commission found plenty of evidence to recommend to the LCC that the license be revoked, and it was. Now, that whole process took about a year and a half, and nobody was happy with that. I mean, the people wanted us to close them down now and just do it, but there's a legal process, and you have to stick to that. Paul Mayhew, county commissioner here in Grand Rapids, and a good one, represents an inner city district. Wanted to run for mayor. Last time John Logie ran as mayor of the city of Grand Rapids. And the charter has a unique provision in it. Of course, keep in mind, it was drafted back in 1916, which says that anyone who holds an office in city government or county government is not authorized to run for the city commission. And any votes cast for that person are void. Well, Paul didn't think that was very fair and he thought it was discriminatory, and so he complained about it and begged the city clerk to accept his nominating petitions, and she wouldn't do it because we had told her it's a legal provision. We had checked that all out. Our best advice was it was legal, even though it wasn't popular, and even though it seems a little bit stupid. Um, but I can see the reasoning for it. They didn't want people using one public office to run for another while holding the other public office, I guess. In any event, he took us to court. Um, we were pilloried in the Grand Rapids Press by my good friend Mike Lloyd because we had a conflict of interest, don't you know? We represented the incumbent mayor and therefore we were trying to protect him from opposition. Well, we were representing the clerk, actually, not the mayor. The mayor wasn't involved in this. The mayor doesn't put people on the ballot. The city clerk does. It was a charter provision, and it's our job to interpret the charter and represent city officials. So there was no conflict of interest, even though Mike Lloyd and his editorial writers would have wanted us to think so. Well, the court upheld us, and to be fair, Paul Mayhew resigned his county board seat. He ran in the primary. Mayor Logie was re-elected in the primary because he got more than 51% of the vote. Paul went right back and was promptly reappointed to his vacancy on the county board and serves to this day in a very good you know, capacity for his, for his residence. One of those interesting kind of things. Humility. It's not about you. It's about the public interest. There was an old TV show called The A-Team. Most of you here are way too young to remember it. But I loved it because George Prepard played Colonel Hannibal Smith. He was kind of the leader of this group of former, I guess, military folks, now mercenaries, and they went around doing good. Sort of a combination of Dukes of Hazard and, and uh, Mission Impossible. And um, he had a famous saying at the end of every show when the plan would come together and it would get all in. He'd say, I love it when a plan comes together. He'd stand there and he'd smile. Well, as a public lawyer, that's a good motto because if you're a lawyer in municipal government, that's the best you're ever going to get. You're not going to get fame and fortune. Three quick examples. Tom Kroon's house. There was a developer that started a project in the west side, the near west side, just over where Grand Valley is now. And this is about 12 years ago. And he quietly went around and he acquired some of these old houses. Some of them were built in the 1880s. They were the houses where the woodworking people and the, some of the original factory workers of Grand Rapids lived. They weren't fancy houses. 
but they were these people's homes, and it was a neighborhood. And he went in and bought them up. And he bought them up in kind of a hopscotch pattern. He didn't have whole blocks. And of course, he couldn't use eminent domain because he was a private developer. But he quietly went about this. And when he got it done, he came to the city and wanted the city, look, we've got all these. We've got like six or seven we don't have. I'd like to work with the city. I want to do this big project. Well, nobody wanted his big project. But it did pique the interest of the DDA, the Downtown Development Authority, because they were in the process of acquiring some land on the west side to augment what Grand Valley was already doing and, and wanting to acquire some of those properties. So they set about the process of not only buying what he had already acquired, but using eminent domain to go about the process of acquiring the final few, one of which was Tom Kroon's house. Tom was a city council gadfly. He came to all of our meetings. He was an elderly man. I think he'd had health problems over the years. His parents had died. He was born in that house, and he by this time was 65 or 67. He'd been there a long time. And so quickly, public support got behind Tom Kroon. That was big city hall versus poor Tom Kroon. And no one likes to be in that circumstance, even if you're representing big city hall. I mean, it, uh, you don't win those kinds of battles in the public opinion. Well, what we finally worked out and was satisfactory to even the Grand Rapids Press was that we would, we would actually acquire Tom's property and we would pay him for that. And we would give him a, a life lease, if you will, allowing him to live on this property. All he had to do was pay the taxes. And there were certain circumstances because he was in failing health that if he actually moved out and was hospitalized or could no longer live in the house, then, then we would take possession of it. And that worked out well. And it sort of soothed the problem. And the parking lot was first there. Now you have the YMCA there. So you know, it was the, a step in the process. The art museum was another example. The city owned what was called the Wurzburg lot, that big circus parking lot on Monroe Mall for 25 years since the old Wurzburg building was torn down. And we spent all kinds of time trying to figure out what we were going to put there. Surface parking lots in the center of a downtown district is not the highest and best use for the property. Well, along comes the Art Museum, which was then located in the old federal building, saying, we want to expand. We can't bring in nice new traveling art exhibits. We've got an old building. We can't secure it, so on and so forth. We want this property to build our new art museum. And they had beautiful renderings to show the city commission. Only catch, to make it work, the city had to give them the property. Well, this goes back to that, you know, Mr. Mayor, <laughs> we can't do that. Um, of course, I was really popular um, because the state constitution prohibits cities from basically giving away their property to a private entity, even one that runs an art museum. Aha, the DDA stepped in again, and they have it in their statutory provisions and their charter. They can do this to promote economic activity and educational activity. So we got the property appraised. We swapped it with the DDA for property they had acquired down here by the arena. Dollar for dollar basis, the city, the public, if you will, got 100% of the value for that Wurzburg lot. As soon as the DDA got it, they contributed it to the art museum project, and it opened last fall. Sometimes you just have to be tricky when it comes to legal matters. I didn't say unethical, I said tricky. There is a difference. The Amway, a few years back, the Amway Grand Plaza Hotel, filed a tax appeal. Now, it's the biggest and best hotel in Grand Rapids. And if you read their tax appeal that they filed with the tax tribunal, you would think this was the worst piece of junk next to a railroad yard. And you, would, you, would, you wouldn't wonder if anybody would stay there. Who would stay in this hotel? I mean, they had all these terrible things wrong with it. This roof leaked. And that, you know, it would have been embarrassing if some of that stuff had gone public. Well, the Grand Rapids Press, I guess, thought it was interesting that two of the largest benefactors in the history of Grand Rapids, and they still are, bless them, and that's the Van Andel and the DeVos families, pour millions and tens of millions of dollars into things we do here. At the same time, their hotel was trying to get their taxes lowered. A little bit of a dichotomy, but you, but, you know, you, you do get that in the, in the public sector. Well, immediately, the press filed an FOIA request for all of the documents that had been filed by the Amway Grand Plaza Hotel and their lawyers in this tax appeal. What had happened in Lansing at the tax tribunal some of the sensitive material, market studies and so on, that the Amway didn't want to have printed in the paper, they got the tax tribunal uh, judge to issue a uh, basically a sealed order, an order sealing those documents, preventing them from being disclosed, confidentiality order. 
So now we're on the horns of a dilemma. We look in the FOIA, we can't find anything that says we can lawfully withhold that from giving it to the media, but we're under an MTT order not to do it. And if we violate that, our tax case goes right in the dumpster. So, again, a little trickiness, we filed a lawsuit against the press, the Amway Grand Plaza Hotel, and the state of Michigan. We sued them for declaratory judgment, and we said, hey, we've got this nice packet of secret material here, Judge, it's in a sealed thing, and they've sued us, they want it, the other people don't want us to give it to them, and you know what, we're the citizens of Grand Rapids, and we don't care. So if you want it, you guys can fight over it, because you're the ones who are the parties in interest. So they battled it out back and forth for the next year and a half. The press won, and the press got substantial legal fees, and I think Mike Lloyd is still mad that I got out without losing to him on that case. <laughs> you need to have heart. And that is you have to have the courage to defend something when you think that others don't necessarily share your viewpoint. A case in point that actually made law that's still good today is, is the menorah, which appears annually on the Calder Plaza. I don't know whether any of you saw it this year, I'm told it was still there. I get to the point now where I don't even see it because it's been there for so many years. But local Rabbi Weingarten wanted to erect a large Hanukkah menorah on Calder Plaza. And Calder Plaza is a, is a public forum. Now, right away, you people have had con law. Your ears go up and you, okay, this is going to get good. Well, anyway, um, we had all kinds of things out there. We've had anti-war protests. We've had you know abortion protests. You name it, it's been on Calder Plaza. So the city commission asked us, is it legal? Can we tell them no? Should we tell them yes? A lot of people don't want us to tell them yes. Well, you check it out. It's a traditional public forum. Denial would only be based on the content of the speech, which would be religious. It's an open forum. And so having an open forum is an acceptable secular purpose. The city will merely be allowing access to that, not promoting anything. And we don't think that the simply putting up a menorah is going to have any uh, advancement of religion to it, especially with a disclaimer that we crafted, made them put up. Now, if that does sound like a common law class, I am sorry, but the menorah went up, and surprisingly, because I'm not Jewish, I guess, the objection came from the Jewish community. I didn't realize that Rabbi Weingarten was not representing mainstream Judaism, at least in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and that there were other congregations here in this city that did not think that was the kind of thing that ought to be on a public plaza. It's the kind of thing you celebrate at home with your families. And I understand that now. Also, the ACLU came to us every year for four years. These people came in four years. Every year, of course, the media was out there watching Rabbi Weingarten light the first light of the menorah, lantern, and it would be on the front page of the paper. Second year was on the second page, and then it got to the region section and Finally, they stopped covering it, I think. But after four years of being threatened by the ACLU that they would sue us, and I kept saying to them every year, please sue me. I want to be in a case where the city stands for free speech and the ACLU does not. <laughs> Nothing against the ACLU. They're a wonderful organization, but that would be my dream case. Well, they never did, but the Americans United for Separation of Church and State did, and they actually prevailed at the local federal court, took it to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Sixth Circuit stayed the lower court's decision and then ruled against us. So that was exciting. So we asked for a rehearing on Bonk and were granted it. All 15 judges heard the case and a wonderfully strong 9 to 6 decision. Boy, you love 9 to 6 decisions out of 15. But a couple of excerpts, I think, uh, are kind of nice. The establishment of a public forum is a laudable goal and part of a worthy tradition going back to the Greek Agora and the Roman Forum. Furthermore, the policy avoids entangling government with religion, as no government official need decide which groups use the plaza. When it granted the permit, Grand Rapids stayed firmly on the side of the wall separating church and state. It acted merely as the referee and arbiter of the public space, rather than becoming a participant. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Lastly, a sense of humor. Never work in City Hall without one. Because you really do not know what's going to come at you. John Logie, the longest serving mayor in, in the city's history. For a while, we had the longest serving mayor, the longest serving city manager, and the longest serving city attorney. Two of those three are now gone. The city manager is still there. 
we'll see how long that lasts. But um, John Logie every year gave a state of the city address to the Downtown Economic Club, or the Economic Club of Greater Grand Rapids, whatever it was called. It was over in the Amway Grand Plaza Hotel, and it was always either the last week of January, first week of February, right about now. And they'd have 300 people in the audience. I mean, it was a big deal. And he would work on these speeches, I'm sure, all during the holidays. And they were wonderful speeches. Well, this year, this particular year, which was 2000, the legislature had had some bills introduced that would liberalize the state's law on carrying concealed weapons. That law has subsequently been passed. But at the time, the mayor was really upset about that. He thought the problem of guns in the city was a problem. He thought that this legislation would only make that problem worse. And he wanted to drive this point home. Excuse me. And he wanted to drive it home with a flare, as John Logie was wont to do on occasion. So he said to me, I want to be able to carry a gun, and I want to pull it out, and I want to shock the audience. I said, Mayor, do you have a permit to carry a concealed weapon? He said, no. I said, then you can't do it. He said, then get me a permit. I said, right. Walking out of his office not knowing where in my job classification that fell exactly. <laughs> But after researching it completely and talking with Bill Forsyth, the county prosecutor, and the county clerk, I was reassured that that wasn't possible, so the mayor would have to have some other idea. I went back in and gave him that good news. Well, John does not like to have that kind of news delivered to him, although he trusted my legal decision. The police were quick to say, look, just use a training gun. We have guns that are heavy and they... We use them when we have hand-to-hand -hand combat training to try to disarm suspects and so on, and use one of those. And they brought one along. And it looks, for all the world, like a real gun. It's bright blue plastic. Now, the mayor was not about to pull a bright blue plastic gun out of his coat, because after the laughter died down, he'd have to explain what the shock value was supposed to be. So he turned to me and said, that's not good enough. I want it, I want it now. Get it done. Well. There's a place in town called Theatrics, and they sell props, and they sell costumes, and they sell all kinds of things. So I drove out there on my lunch day, just like today. Drove out there, I went in and said, do you have stage guns? He said, yes, we do. I said, are they capable of firing any kind of a projectile? He said, no. We, they're just heavy and clunky, and they look real, and the kind that they drop on the floor. I said, I want one. So I rented one, paid my own money, got it back to City Hall with a shoulder holster. Oh, he was in love with it. Put it on. He was in love with it. So he goes to his speech, but before he goes, I have to call the GRPD to tell him what he's going to do, the prosecutor to tell him what he's going to do, and most importantly, Amway security. Because, you know, if, if I were doing it here, I'm not going to. Uh, and, and you've got security personnel, and suddenly the speaker pulls out a gun. I mean, even if he's the mayor, you know, you go, well, wait a minute here. Um, and I didn't want a dead mayor on my conscience. I also told him that I remembered, even though it had been decades, that from my torts class, don't point it at anybody, you know? That could be an assault, even if it's not a real gun. If they think it's a real gun, it looks like a real gun, they might get frightened. You might have a heart attack in the front row. Don't do that. So he didn't. He pulled it out, held it up, and of course, there was the gas that everybody anticipated. I mean, he loved it. He just loved it. There was enough of a showman in him that he just absolutely just enjoyed it. And of course, the following day, headlines in the Grandpa's Press, Mr. Mayor, is that a real gun you're holding? Because, hey, I mean, it looked for all the... Of course, he didn't tell him it was a fake gun. He just laid it back down and went on with his speech about how, you know, we don't want to have this kind of stuff being proliferated out in the community. Well, they actually went out to this place called Theatrics to check to see if I really had rented a fake gun. Because by now I'd returned it, you know. And uh, they didn't trust me. I don't understand that. <laughs> Lastly, and most fun, I hope, for you, is the LAV annual raft race. Most of you here are too young to remember it, thankfully. But it was a, a race held on the Grand River up near Riverside Park on an annual basis. It was sponsored by Stroh's Brewery, you gotta love that, and WLAV, which was a rock station at the time. I don't know whether it still is. And the idea was to have companies and offices and stuff get together and build a homemade raft and float down the river for prizes. And it was kind of fun. It started out being a family event and ended up being a drunken mess. Um, the last year it was held, Marvin Hensel, the plaintiff, 
like your law school classes comes now, the plaintiff, Marvin Hensel got hurt, and he got hurt badly. At the time, he was 21. He crashed the race, meaning he wasn't part of any one of the rafts or any part of the crew. He got injured. He sued the city for permitting a nuisance. He sued LAV and Strohs for hosting a nuisance. And he sued the young woman that pushed him off her raft, causing him to fall in the river and get hurt, for causing his injuries. Now, defense of that case took hard work and a great sense of humor. And you'll quickly find out why. He was seeking $3.6 million in damages from all the defendants. So it was a serious case. Let me tell you about the, about the plaintiff. That day, the day of the race, he drank two six-packs of beer, smoked several joints of marijuana, swam, I don't know how he had time with drinking all that beer, <laughs> swam out to a raft he didn't belong on, climbed on, was pushed off, landed with his head on the bottom of the river and broke his neck and became a quadriplegic. There's nothing funny about that. His injuries are tragic. But the fact that he wanted to blame and find someone else responsible is incredible. I guess, unless you're a plaintiff's attorney. The jury heard the evidence and awarded him $3.6 million against all the defendants, except the woman that pushed him off the raft. In their specific jury instruction, or their jury verdict form, they ruled she was negligent, but her negligence was not a proximate cause of his injury. If that won't send the torts professors scratching their heads, I don't know what will. Well, thankfully, the the part against the city was overturned by the Court of Appeals, a wise group of people, um, who held that we were immune by governmental immunity. But at the trial, one of the key pieces that came out that was read to the jury was the reflections by the deputy parks director of that event. And this is what you have to put up with when you're defending a client that's an in-house client, and you, you can't tell them to go find another lawyer. I mean, this was his... This was his uh, report that was read to the jury. Picture yourselves as a jury in this case and listen to these words. Saturday morning, race day, 7 a.m. The park is in readiness. You gotta love it. The city does its job well. 8 a.m., first rafts being launched. Rafts going into the river slowly, averaging about 15 per hour. Observe the procedures and talk with rafters some already showing alcoholic influence. Now this is eight o'clock in the morning. Launch Marshall always drinking beer. 10 a.m., motorcycle and bike corral opens and functioning. Young male and female attendants are being hassled by the motorcyclists. Should have had older and larger and more attendants. 11 o'clock, first rafts are approaching midpoint. They want, <clears throat> WLAV wanted more snow fence to keep out the unwanted people, whoever they are. Two o'clock, the rock concert started. DJ says the city has been giving the race a hard time, you know, because we wanted to have some rules and stuff like that. Crowd of 5,000 at the band shell. Many drunk or spaced out on other substances. <laughs> this, this is our witness, folks. Some threats to street preachers, but nothing serious. I guess unless you're a street preacher, then that might be serious. <laughs> Motorcycles got into the concert crowd area. That must have been a sight. Very heavy drinking and drug use. Observed very young people smoking marijuana. Okay. Four o'clock now. We made it from two to four. Crowd orderly, but heavy beer and wine consumption taking its toll. Now, if anything... You, you will learn this person is the master of understatement. Bottle thrown from shore, hit rafter in back. Heated exchange of words, long lines at the porta johns. <laughs> and you know, you can, you can imagine that, I guess. All police left the area between six and seven. The park could not be secured by park personnel because great numbers of people were still in the area. Barricades could not be reinstalled nor could restrooms be locked. Park personnel were threatened when attempting to do so. Well, I guess. Race resulted in one drowning and two broken necks, one causing probable permanent paralysis. Red Cross records indicate a total of 62 treated for injuries, varying from overdoses of alcohol and drugs 
to severed tendons and scalp wounds. One first aid station did not even report. I don't know what happened to them. <laughs> Finally, in his conclusion, summary recommendations. The jury really loved this. Considering the size of the crowd, the number of vehicles, motorcycles, bikes, and rafts, and the amount of alcohol and drugs consumed, I feel we may have been most fortunate to have sustained only one death and two broken necks. <laughs> The potential for catastrophe is most certainly there. <laughs> it's what could have happened that's worrisome. And I don't even want to contemplate what that might have been. So it can be exciting, it can be funny, and I've got time for questions if you've got time to stay. Any questions at all? Yes? Making, making a difference. And, and I think having um, a part to play in some of the decisions behind the scenes, of course, because you're not, no one hired me to be a policy uh, advisor. But inherently, a little bit of that comes in because when you know the organization, going back to what Alan Grimes said about the role of the city attorney, when you know what the organization wants to do, you don't go very far in this kind of a job or a county attorney job or a corporate counsel for a university by just saying, I'm sorry, the law doesn't allow you to do that. Um, I mean, you'll last a year or two and then they'll find someone who's got a little bit more of a brain than that because what they want you to be able to tell them is you can't do that or you can't do it that way, but you could do almost what you want to do if you just do it this way. Or if you get this group involved, you get the same result. The Croc Center is a good example. We bumped heads with the community out there in Garfield Park for quite some time because the McDonald's people and Mrs. Croc wanted to have the Salvation Army build a wonderful recreational center out there uh, and take the place of that old, you know, dilapidated, rundown place. But it just wasn't a politically doable thing. And so we went and we found some other property that was vacant. It was owned by the water department. Again, we got dollar for dollar on that. And so there's nothing going on there except a sale of city property. It's where it's still in the general region that can be reached. All those kids can reach it by either a quick bus hop or they can walk. And you can get the project done. But I have to tell you, it depends on getting involved early on. But that's exciting. When you can be part of a project that comes to fruition, you know, that really helps. Yes, Heather. Um, recently, we've seen some headlines about a gun ring coming in city council. Oh, like last night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sure, sure there were. Uh, and just like this unfortunate incident that happened uh, in Missouri last evening, and if you haven't heard about that, a gunman walked into a city council meeting and shot and killed six people. Um, and he was a person that had had run-ins with the city before for uh, housing violations, that kind of thing. He recently had sued the city in federal court to try to you know, say that they had violated his constitutional rights. That had been thrown out. And, and so the first person he shot at was the city attorney. I thought that was exciting. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's the kind of thing that, that can happen. Unfortunately, we have a society that falls back on violence when they can't do anything else, and that's terribly tragic. There were times over the years when we knew situations were going to be volatile. That doesn't necessarily mean we anticipated people bringing guns, but you don't have to bring a gun into a, a city commission chambers to, to cause a problem. I mean, you can throw objects, you can create disruptions. So those times we would try to have members of the police department there. Um, but yeah, it goes through everybody's mind. The one, the one time that was a little frightening was when Mayor Helmholtz was mayor, and I sat right next to the mayor, and the city manager sits on my, my left, and the city clerk sits on the mayor's right. I don't know why I had that seat. I, that's where they said the city attorney sat when I got there, so that's where I sat. And it was nice because I could keep track of both the mayor and the manager and, and you know, have little sidebars with them. But we had a fellow came in, and, and he was um, sort of disheveled and, and looked like he might be um, not all there. Um, sometimes you get that sense when you see someone. They look like they're agitated or something like that. And he had a, he had a bag with him, a, a big canvas bag. 
and I always worry a little bit about people who bring large canvas bags into public meetings. I mean, nowadays, of course, you've got students with backpacks, you've got, you got people with laptops. I mean, so you have to get over a little of that. There's always a point at the end of the meeting where they have time for public comment, time before the meeting as well. The mayor said time for public comment, and a few people got up and said some things. Anyone else? He was about to gavel the meeting to a close. The guy sitting right in the front, front row reaches down in his bag, and as he's pulling up, just like this guy said last night, he said, just that I'm going to shoot you, mayor. And he, comes like, and he goes like this, and what he's got in his hand is one of those umbrellas that are collapsible and go out and then open up. And it went, poof, and opened up. And then he laughed like man and said, scared you, didn't I? Well, scare me, didn't I? I mean, yeah. Uh, so, you know, the problem is, is that in today's society, you have a, a confluence of things coming at you. You've got the right for the people to come into a city commission meeting. It's the basic level of government. It's where the rubber meets the road, folks. If you can't come down and talk to your local government, what good is democracy, okay? So you want to have an open city hall policy. At the same time, you're sitting up there in a dais up high, you know, nothing but a quarter inch of plywood separating you from whatever somebody wants to throw at you or shoot at you, and it can be a scary situation. Um, luckily, in Grand Rapids, we've had a wonderful track record of people just getting angry with their voices and never causing anything. I can't even, in fact, no one has ever even been arrested in a city commission meeting. And there are places in this state that routinely get so disrupted that they have to bring the police in first, and then it continues to get disrupted, so the mayor or whomever has to gavel the meeting to a close and say, we're adjourned, and they actually close the meeting. And uh, we've never had that, and, and hopefully we never will. But it's, it's a frightening thing. Yes? Well, I think it will raise the dialogue on whether or not a 92-year-old charter, uh, well-intentioned as it was, and part of, as I said, this reform movement that's, that swept the country back in 1916, is still reflective of what people expect out of local government. I think some people expect to be able to pick up a phone and call a strong mayor or a city commissioner and get something done. And I think they're frustrated when they can't do that. Having said that, as a perception, I can tell you that in Grand Rapids, there is no city I can imagine in this state that is more accessible to the public than Grand Rapids. You can email commissioners, you can email the city manager, you can email the city attorney, and you can ask all these questions, you can ask all these things, and you will get an answer. And I have to tell you, that's a pretty amazing thing and pretty exciting. But yes, it will raise that dialogue. I've heard one, excuse me, one commissioner already saying, maybe it's time to look at that charter provision that gives the manager the authority to basically appoint everybody, but the attorney, the clerk, and the treasurer, um, and maybe we need to have some combination. Maybe it's with the advice and consent of the city commission. You know, it wouldn't take much on some of these major positions in city government. And certainly the police chief and the fire chief are two that just come immediately to mind of two jobs that have a tremendous impact, not only on service delivery and the quality of that service delivery, but on how they relate to the public. And they can be total professionals and doing their job wonderfully well, but if the feeling in the community is that they're not doing a good job, then that's almost as bad. So I think that dialogue will proceed. Yes? Well, it is, and you know, with the Open Meetings Act, uh, which I happen to think is, is a good idea, I don't have as many good thoughts on the FOIA because it's taking just way too many resources. But the Open Meetings Act, I think, was a good piece of legislation. And basically, as you all know, it means you have to conduct the city's business, you know, in a public, se in a public session. Now, as a lawyer, you have the right to go into a closed session with your commission to discuss a written legal opinion. And there's a way you get there. But trust me, you can do that. But you can't have that kind of dialogue that you'd like to have if you want to just sit down and brainstorm with your client. What we have done in Grand Rapids is we've worked with the city manager and we've worked with what we call um, policy subcommittees, not policy subcommittees, legislative economic development. They meet in open session. 
there's only three city commissioners there and they talk about things before they percolate up to the level of city commission and it's open to the public and you can get all the information i mean everything's done above board but it allows for a closer dialogue of eight or ten people sitting around a table talking about things having staff getting getting staff directions to go out and get more work done before it's brought back up for city commission approval so there's a way to get that done that's very challenging in the public sector because every city commissioner thinks you are that commissioner's sole attorney and you have to remind them gently because they do hire you 29 times that um, your client is really the city of Grand Rapids it's the corporate institution of the city and they hold an office that's very important to that corporation and you can advise them but you are not their lawyer and so it becomes a little difficult thing anything else Dean Timmer would never forgive me if I didn't end with a poem. So I'm going to end with a little Robert Frost poem that's short, to the point, and maybe some food for thought, especially in this election year when there's going to be a lot of thinking going on. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to know that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. Thanks a lot.